So if we just kind of took a glance at the world at large, all of its nations, all of its people, I think that if we were honest with one another and took a moment to think about it deeply and slowly enough, we might find that, that we feel like we're at a little bit of a crossroads. There are enough things that are happening in the world. There are enough things that seem to have been happening for generations, decades, maybe even thousands of years, that they don't really sit right with us. There's something in them that it just, we encounter it and we think, eh, shouldn't be that way. Should there, should there really still be hunger? Should there really still be genocide? Should there really still be people bought and sold into slavery? People of all ages, stolen and then sold into sex trafficking? Should there really be, I mean, isn't there something in us that, that we, if we stop long enough and we think about it and we address what the reality really is of the conditions, doesn't it feel like man, we're just at this little bit of a crossroads where it's like, okay, we can continue to go this way. And that path is like beaten down, so it's fairly accessible. Like somebody's already cleared a lot of the, the debris and, and, and the rubble. So it's easy to find war. It's easy to find conflict. It's easy to find tragedy and, and, and crisis. Or is there this other way? Like is there a different path that maybe isn't quite as clear yet and maybe isn't quite as trafficked yet, but is somehow different at least? Maybe if we're not even sure it's better yet, it's at least different, right? And we find ourselves at this crossroads saying, look, something's got to give. We could shrink that down a little bit, right? It's one thing to talk about it in the landscape of the entire world. Let's shrink it down a little bit and let's just consider it in light of just our own country. I mean, doesn't it feel like we're a little bit at a, at a crossroads? I mean, how much longer do we really want to live with the same tensions and the same issues? How much longer do we really want to live with escalating hostilities? How, long, how much longer do we really want to live with it being dramatically easier for some than it is for others? How much longer do we really want to live in the way that it seems to have been going and is going? Doesn't it feel like we're a little bit at this crossroads where there's something in us that says, look, something probably could be different and there's a path over here that we're on and it's clearly worn and people are on it and, and the masses seem to be on it and some by choice and some just by default because it's the open path. But there's this other path, and like, again, I'm not even sure if it's better, but couldn't it at least be different? We're at a crossroads where it feels like, don't we have to do something? Don't, I mean, we've, we've got to make a choice, right? It's one thing to talk about it in the landscape of the world. It's another thing to talk about it in the landscape of our nation. It's another thing altogether to just stop and consider it in the landscape of our own lives. and the conflict between siblings, and the conflict between parent and child, and parent and grown child, and grown child and, and parent, and the conflict and the tension around the job, and what it is, and what it's not, and how it's satisfying, and how it doesn't, and how it fatigues, and how it disillusions, and the tension with the, the boss and is there another way out or how do I navigate that or could I do something different or the way our financial pattern seems to keep repeating itself over and over again. We find ourselves like just this inner turmoil at this crossroads and say, now wait a second, something's got to give. Isn't there some different way? Am I, do I have to stay on this path that I'm on? Do I have to stay here? Does our marriage have to stay on this road? Do our finances have to stay on this road? Does the health of my soul and heart, does it have to stay on this road? Because I really don't want it to. And so almost daily, we, we sometimes find ourselves at this crossroads and saying, okay, what are my options? Which one? How do I pick? And what even is crossroad A and crossroad B? I mean, it, it creates something in us. And if we stop long enough today just to like survey the room, right? If we all just took three minutes and came up here and shared our crossroads, man, they, they'd be so many and so diverse. 
all of us in different pockets of our life wrestling with, okay, something's going to give. What am I going to do? It can't keep going the same way. Does it have to keep going the same way? What are my options? What are the forward opportunities? What's really interesting and what's maybe encouraging is that the story of God actually invites us into sorting out those crossroad moments in our life. The, the story of God and Jesus in his story and invites us into a way to, to navigate those crossroads. But here's the, here's the fascinating part. Um, Jesus actually helps us navigate the, these crossroad moments of life by bringing us to a crossroads. <laughs> Like, he does it by saying, okay, look, let, let me give you a crossroads, and that'll actually shed some light on all the other crossroads. And that's kind of where we find ourselves in this story of God's series as we navigate the story of Jesus in the scriptures. And let's just remember how, how we got here. It all started with the beginning of the story of God being about this thing that we call creation and, and this reality, this beauty that God just didn't throw it all into motion just because, but that God created out of the overflow of his love that God had so much love to give that it just, it had to get out. He was like bursting at the seams and love expresses itself in creativity. Listen, love expresses itself most naturally in creativity. And so God creates, he speaks this world into existence. He gives people like you and me life so that we can enjoy his presence and enjoy partnership with him in the world and enjoy his people. Uh, but then, you know, we choose separation. We choose sin. God didn't choose separation. We chose separation. We chose to, to live in a moment as if, if God was holding out on us, if there was a better way. We, we were presented with a crossroads when presented with temptation and humanity, can't just blame it on Adam and Eve, humanity said, oh, wait, let's, let's choose this way in which we live like God is holding out on us. And in that, this relationship gets fractured and we chose the separation God never did, which sheds light on God's response. See, God's response, which is kind of the third move in the story of God, which Pastor Joel unpacked for us so amazingly well last week, is this bottom line reality, that when we choose separation, God over and over and over again reminds us that what he values most is relationship, not retribution. When we sin, when we choose the separation, when we choose to live like we can do it by our own way, God's aim is not to get even with us. It's to get back with us. God's aim is not somehow to enact his vengeance upon us. It's to restore relationship with us. And over and over again in the story of God, we see him presenting that to us. Him saying, man, what I really still value is you and presence with you and partnering with you and allowing you to enjoy the other people that I put you here with. God values relationship more than retribution. And throughout the Old Testament of the Bible, that points and highlights and just points this big flashing arrow to this person of Jesus. And that's where we find ourselves today and kind of as we move through this story of God is, is that the life of Jesus. Now, here, here's the catch. Here's the catch. Look. When we get to Jesus, um, just, it, 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 just kind of almost by accident, uh, we like to skip ahead and get to his death and, and his resurrection, right? Like, let's just have Easter, okay? And that's cool. I mean, that's great. It's a huge, it's probably the pivot point of the story. But, but, there's something about Jesus' life before his death. There's something about the way in which Jesus lives in the world before we encounter his death and his resurrection. You see, if it was only about the cross, if it was only about get to the cross, then God in all of his sovereignty would have had a bunch of people just write, hey, Jesus lived a really cool life, did some miracles, whoo, you should have seen those, and then he died and rose again. But instead, we get this handful of years window into Jesus' life where we see things he taught. We actually see inside of the, the miracles that he did. We see the relationships he developed. We see the people he developed along with those relationships. And we actually see like a crossroads develop. We actually see Jesus putting some things on the table in, in front of us. And which he's really saying, look, I came, yes, I, I came to, to die and rise again, but I, but I came to show you something bef before that. And we start to see that in these books that we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the New Testament of the Bible. They're the first four books, and what you have is the New Testament of the Bible. 
And here's how one of them launches. And I love this. This written by a guy named Mark, inspired by the Spirit. And Mark's probably my favorite of the four gospel accounts. And this is what Mark says in, in chapter one. He says this. This is the, what's the next word? This is the what? Say it again. This is the what? It's okay to talk in church. Let's get used to it, okay? If this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So here's what it is. Listen, Mark is going to tell this whole story of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, and he describes all of that as the beginning. He describes all of that as the beginning. It's just that Je- so Jesus is launching something. Jesus is starting something. What's he starting? Well, just a little bit further down in that same chapter, verse 15, we find Jesus saying this about himself. The time has come. It's like the time has come. All of this Old Testament pointing has been done. And now the time has come. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God has come near. So repent and do something different. Now, let's just walk that out a little bit. The kingdom of God is really just Jesus saying, look, I've come as a king. I've come to be king. And we don't have perfect boxes for that. We live in a democracy. We elect people, we, right? Jesus says, look, I've, I've come to be king And inside of the kingdom, there's a way of living like the king. What Jesus is really saying is, look, I've come to be king. I'm going to invite you to live in my way, and I'm going to invite you to to repent and turn from living the way of a different kingdom. Whenever we enter one kingdom, we kind of operate in the way of that kingdom. For, For instance, this, we do it when we leave another country. Like when we leave our country to go to another country, we, we kind of do things the way they might do them, right? We hopefully drive on the correct side of the road. Okay? We do it even in our own country if we, you know, leave states. Uh, a handful of years ago, I was in um, New Jersey in the middle of winter, and I was driving and pulled in to get gas. You probably know this, but in New Jersey, don't you dare get out to pump your own gas, Okay, the gas station attendant pumps your gas. Okay, that's not your job to do that. And I was like, oh, oh, wait. And then I realized, oh, I'm in New Jersey in the middle of winter. Please pump my gas and please come back to Michigan with me. (laughs) Yes, can I get an amen, somebody? Come on, I mean, I was like, this, this is heaven. Okay, I don't know anything else about New Jersey, but this is good, right? Yes, but we're in New Jersey, so we do things in the way of New Jersey, right? That, and that's kind of how this kingdom works. Whichever kingdom we live in, we actually do the things the way of the king. So Jesus says, look, I've come, to, I've come to introduce this kingdom to you, my kingdom to you, my way of, of doing things. I didn't just come to get to a cross. I came to show you something else. But here's the deal. There's, there's like a tension in that. We bumped into it in the second move of the story when we sin and this co- we're part of, realize we're part of this cosmic battle that's, that's taking place. Jesus talks about it lots of ways, but he talks about it one way in John 10.10, 10, which is a, a verse we use a lot around here. It just kind of captures our heart at Journey, but this is Jesus talking. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He's talking about Satan there. He's talking about these principalities of darkness, and what he's doing is he's describing a kingdom. He's describing the kingdom of evil or the kingdom of Satan. He says that in that kingdom, the goal is to steal, kill, and destroy your life. Now listen, listen, we gotta be careful there because that can get, we can automatically start to think, whoo, yeah, I mean, that must be really overt, dramatic, scary, awful things. And it can be, it can be. But in the culture in which we live, it can also be very nice things. Like I just wanna give you a little heads up. Satan can nice your soul to death. In which we get so much good outside that actually our inside just kind of goes flat and numb. And we don't become hateful and we don't become vengeful and we don't, but it just kind of becomes dead because we get so much good. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy your life. And whatever cunning, crafty thing that takes, that's what's on the table. And Jesus says, that's one kingdom, but I actually came to to invite you into a different kingdom, one in which you will have life and have it to the, what's the last word of this verse? Life and have it to the what? Have it to the full, more than enough, beyond vitality in ways that can't be measured, depth of satisfaction, settledness, wholeness. Jesus says, that's what I came to give you. And, And so he says, but listen, listen, You're living at a crossroads. You're living at a constant crossroads. 
There are two kingdoms at play. Jesus didn't just come to get to a cross. He came to highlight the two kingdoms for us, to make us aware and to help us see. And so what I'd love to do is just kind of share with us a couple of the ways those kingdoms are opposite one another. And here's the thing. Every kingdom of the world or kingdom designed to to be a thief and steal, kill, and destroy our life, listen, it can be packaged in really good things. And it's remarkably common and remarkably natural. So let's just walk it out a little bit. Here's, Here's one way in which the kingdom of the thief works or the kingdom of the world works. In the kingdom of the world, the goal is leveraging power. It's leveraging power. You see, Jesus is is talking about all of this, and his life is being lived in a time where the Jewish people were kind of under the thumb of Rome, and Rome was the power of the day. Well, what does Rome want to do? Rome wants to leverage its power. The leaders in Rome, they want to leverage their power to get more power. So much so that some of them would kill their own family members if they thought that they were a threat to their power. And they want to leverage it. They, they want to hold it, right? Listen, can we just all agree? We live in a world where far too many people are in positions of leadership where the thing they're doing is leveraging power. And they're trying to protect that power. They're trying to facilitate power more than it is anything else. It's not just in Jesus' day. It's, it's in ours too. But again, it's one thing to talk about the world and it's one thing to talk about our nation. Let's just talk about you and me. Come on now, when when things get tough, we leverage some power. Leveraging power is the part of us that when things get tense in our family, we want to make sure we're right, we want to make sure we're heard. We want to make sure we get our own way. And we might do it through hostility or we might do it through the subtle trappings of kind manipulation. But we want to leverage that power, we want to leverage our position because we become convinced that that's the place of security and strength. And Jesus comes and lives a completely different way and he, and he models with his life and he talks over and over about, oh no, actually, let's, let's live in a different way. Let's live with humble authority. Let's live with humble authority. Jesus lives with this humility and strength together, one and the same. And it comes because he knows who he is and he knows whose he is. He knows he's loved by his father. He knows he's approved by his father, cherished by his father. He, just, he is anchored in who he is. And it gives him all of this humility of saying, look, that means I don't have to go prove who I am. I already am who I am. And it gives him an authority and a strength to just say, look, no matter what anybody else does around me or to me, this is still who I am. It's why Jesus, in the middle of facing his own life and death, it's why he doesn't even respond to most of his accusers. He doesn't even give an answer. He's not even going to get into the debate. Because he's already convinced. And his primary objective is not to try and convince them. See, listen, Jesus, look at Jesus came in humble authority. Jesus didn't come to try and leverage power by getting the throne in Rome. Jesus didn't come and try, even though people wanted to, Jesus didn't come so he could try and overthrow a government system that happened to be the expression of the world at the time. Jesus didn't come to get the throne in Rome. Jesus didn't come to get the White House. Let me just say it again. Jesus didn't come to get the throne of Rome, and Jesus didn't come to get the White House. And I know that's super unsettling for some of you. But it, it's, it's a non-factor to Jesus. Jesus came and said, look, I don't need... I don't need positional power to offer you a whole different way and to be a king. I just need to stay sure of who I am and who God made me to be and how the Father loves me and invite you into that. And he does it over and over with humble authority. It's why he says things like, man, blessed and full of life are people who are poor in spirit, who aren't so full of themselves they get in their own way, who are meek and willing to kind of step aside and aren't addicted to power that they could try and leverage. She says, there's two different ways, and I want to invite you into this way because humble authority is steadying and calming and trying to leverage power is actually very fragile. And when you have the power that you think you can leverage, who's to say you get to keep the power you think you can leverage? Newsflash, Rome doesn't exist like that anymore. (laughs) It, It fades, it comes, and it goes. How do we navigate it inside of relationships? Which one do we choose when we're faced with the crossroads of conflict and tension? Which option are we, are we choosing? Jesus says, I want to give you a freeing, full life way that will not always be easy and will not always have perfect outcomes. 
but will have a settledness of soul for you. Kind of associated with that, it's kind of this passing it down thing. Jesus lived in a day and age, and he was confronted with the fact, and the people he was living with were conf- confronted with this pattern, just this habit of temporary gaining. The goal was to gain. The goal wasn't just to gain power, it was to gain stuff, it was to gain stature, it was to gain image, it was to gain sitting at the right table with the right crowd, getting the right level of job, having the right kind of home, raising the right kids so that we could present the right way. It's this thing of give, it's this thing of constantly gaining as much as we can. And listen, all of those things can be good, remember? But it's also very easy to get niced to death. And Jesus spoke into into a world a couple thousand years ago that was clinging to its stuff and clinging to its resources. It's why Jesus talked about things like money and stuff more than twice as much as he talked about heaven and hell combined. And even more, check this out, he talked about money and stuff even more than he talked about prayer. What? Isn't prayer like the super spiritual? It's great, it's this gift, right? And yet Jesus said, look, pray all you want, but if the wrong thing's got the core of your being, it's, so Jesus offers this other model. He says, actually, instead of just being a, kind of caught in the subtle trap of temporary gaining, let's, let's have eternal giving. Let's just hold our money and our stuff loosely. Let's, let's just... Let's be willing to give it. Let's be willing to part with it. Jesus said over here that money on occasion, he actually said money could be a God. In and of itself, it's not evil, but if it becomes the anchoring point, it becomes literally a God. He said, so let's just give it away. It's why why he did things like celebrate the lady who gave her last two coins. It's why the only thing, (laughs) this is one of my favorite parts of all of Jesus, the only thing Jesus applauded about the Pharisees, these really stiff religious leaders who made it hard for people to get to Jesus, you know the only thing he ever cheered them on for? Was tithing. (laughs) That's awkward in church, isn't it? I know, right? But it's, look, it's the only thing, right? He's like, out of all the things you're doing, whoo, well done on the tithing front. But could you be kind to people and give people access to me and let people be, right? Because he knows, right, this is, part of the, this is part of the hiccup, right? It's like, so let's just, let's just give. There's a story in Mark chapter 10 where Jesus encounters this guy who we only know as the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler is a pretty good guy, like pretty moral, upstanding guy. And he comes to Jesus and says, man, come on, tell me what it's going to be really like to follow you. I know all the commands. I love people. I'm kind. I'm a pretty forgiving fellow. I, you know, I serve the poor. Like, I, you know, I've got this thing going. And Jesus says, oh, man, you're right. Those are really good. Like, you know the commandments, and you've memorized that thing, and you're super good at church, and you're kind and respectful to your parents, and all those kind of things. You're really good. But there's this one thing, really, that's, that's a barrier between me and you. There's this one reason that you still don't actually feel like you're actually with me. And it's all this stuff, not that you have, but it's all this stuff that has you, that you're dependent upon. So go sell everything you have and just give it to the poor. Just, just go empty it out, and then come and follow me. And Mark records the scene. It's, this, it, it's, a, it's an amazing scene. Mark records the scene with this rich young guy walking away with his head down and his face sad. And the followers of Jesus are like, wait, what, what gives? What, what's happening? Jesus, the hard truth just is that it can be really hard for what Jesus called a rich person to follow Jesus because it's just very easy and very natural to depend on our stuff and our wealth and what we build up and to make it our source and to allow it to be our strength and sometimes even use it to leverage our power. And Jesus says, so let's, let's just hold it all loosely. Let's, let's give it. Let's hand it away. Let's, let's give it to what I'm doing. Let's give it to my kingdom and to life change and then to rescue and to hope and, and to healing. And to, let's give it to that. It's a challenge, right, to wrestle with, okay, wait, how am I? In the middle of my tensions, am I leveraging my power, am I walking with humble authority? When confronted with just life, am I in a pattern of just temporary gaining because at the end of the day, I am kind of banking my, my security on that? Or am I living in a way that would allow my soul the capacity to actually be full of this one who gives me life, but just eternally giving? 
And then, then one more, um, which, which I think might be one of the most potent ones for us at our season of life. It's this reality that there's the pattern of the world, that the kingdom of the world is bent towards how do I reach comfort? How do I get comfort? How do I get an easy life? How do I make life comfortable? How do I take off the rough edges? Now listen, there are times where life is full of grief and it's full of turmoil and Jesus describes himself as comfort and Jesus weeps with people who weep, he mourns with people who mourn. But that's when we're relying on Jesus to be that. But there's this other side in which it becomes very easy. Like if I, can, if I can just get one more promotion, if I can just have one more job, if I can just get one more thing settled, if I can just find the easiest path possible, what Jesus really wants is me to be comfortable. And here's the, here's the challenge, is that Jesus comes and lives something completely, just radically different. Jesus comes and says, comfort, huh. I actually came to give myself away. I actually came to set my face like flint and head towards a cross that's out there in front of me somewhere for the sake of you. I actually left heaven to come. I actually gave you life in the creation story. I'm a giver by nature, and giving just includes sacrifice. And here's the tension. We can find ourselves over here on the comfort side and what we really worship and find ourselves at home in is kind of the blessings of God. We're good with God if we're getting stuff. We're good with God if things are easy. We're good with God if the promotion happens. We're good with God if something gets healed. We're good with God if everything works out. We're good with God if people are good with us. But the minute those fade, we find ourselves so vulnerable and Jesus is saying, look, it was never meant to be built on that. Those are gifts. They're not a foundation. Jesus says, look over here. Like I'm inviting you into fullness of life, and fullness of life actually includes some sacrifice. Right? Jesus talked about it more times than we can almost count. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus said, look, I actually came here to give my life up for you. I actually came to experience sacrifice. I didn't come just to be served. I didn't come to get a throne in Rome so people could serve me. I came to give up my life as a ransom for many people. I came to give away my life. It's like, oh man, that's, yeah, that's different. Matthew chapter 8, he's described as somebody who doesn't even have a place to lay his head at night. Check this out. There's a chunk of Jesus' life where he's homeless. (laughs) What? What? That doesn't sound like comfort. But look, there's a chunk of Jesus' life where he's homeless, and yet he's full. He's got purpose. He's got passion. He's got love. He's got kindness. He's got the capacity to still teach and do miracles and serve people and grieve with people while he's homeless. Look, his life isn't anchored in a comfort. It's anchored in the fullness of his soul in this love relationship with his father. It's like, oh, wait. And over and over and over again, Jesus talks about that. He says, I'm going to give you a lot of good things. But please know also that in those good things, sometimes what comes is persecution. Sometimes what comes is people throwing rocks and boulders at you because you're following me, because you're living in my way, because the kingdom of the world is just very different. They really are in opposition. See, so just... Just for a minute, go back to those crossroads. What are the crossroads in your life right now? What are the moments of tension? What are the, the relationships? I feel like they're defining moments. And just ask, okay, now wait a second. And then when I stand at these crossroads, which, way, which kingdom am I going to choose? Which kingdom am I going to choose? Am I going to choose the kingdom that just seems natural and in front of me and seems easy and where actually the pressure is? Where am I going to choose that? Or am I going to choose this kingdom that actually Jesus says, wait, it won't be easy necessarily. In fact, it's going to include sacrifice, which he's really honest about, but it has this depth and fullness, this texture of life that's so satisfying. See, because here, here's the thing. Here's the thing, listen. Jesus didn't come just to get to a cross. Jesus didn't come just to get to a cross. Jesus came to show us a whole new way of living that the cross would make available to us. 
Jesus didn't come just to get to a cross and make a transaction that would somehow wipe away some sin and get us to heaven. Is that true and part of it? Absolutely. But Jesus came to show us a whole new way of living that was available to us right now. And it's radically different than the sometimes very subtle kingdom of the world which can nice us to death and keep giving us good thing after good thing after good thing after good thing until literally our soul is just numb and flat and missing Jesus on every turn. So let's one more time go back to those crossroads and just imagine this with me. Imagine what the world that we live in would be like if not just people with positions of power, but people with influence at every level, which includes you and me. Imagine what it looked like if the world suddenly became full of people who instead of leveraging power picked humility that comes from an internal strength and instead of seeing how much we could gain, we're willing to see how much we could give and instead of pursuing comfort at all costs, we're willing to sacrifice for the sake of love being shown to the whole. Think about how different the world would be in 30 days. Boil it down to like just our country. Just think how different our own country could be if we could make that exchange, if we could pick a different kingdom, if we could live in Jesus' strength and power in his kingdom and his way. And now you, me, but us. Because before it gets out there anywhere, it's going to get in here, right? What's the crossroads you're at? What are the five crossroads you're at? What's confronting you where you're like, listen, it can't keep going this way. Something's got to give. I can't be in this relationship if this is the direction of the relationship long haul. I can't be in this if it's going to be that unsatisfying and disheartening. I can't be on this road without making some kind of decision about the future Jesus would invite me into with him. I can't carry that bitterness anymore. I'm either going to pick to go get some vengeance or I'm going to lay it down. I can't keep pursuing things that are really good and, and I kind of enjoy, but they're just not bringing any depth and lasting satisfaction. I can't just keep doing the same thing and thinking somehow I'm, I'm going to heal when, to be honest, I've done the same thing for years and nothing's any different and the pain is still as deep and the patterns are still as entrenched. I'm at this crossroads and it just can't be this way anymore. And Jesus says, I know, I know, I know. That's why I came to show you a kingdom. I didn't come just to get to a cross so you could hold on for dear life for heaven. I came to show you a whole different way. came to show you a whole different way. What's your crossroads right now? Which kingdom would you choose? And here's, the, here's the good news. Those three are just like scratching the surface of the ways in which King, Jesus' kingdom is different. If we, if we read the Gospels for more than just some moral teaching and more than just a cool miracle, what we'll find is that Jesus in almost every breath is introducing a completely different way to view the world and experience life. See, look, I know this is what you're in and this is what it is, but what about this? Over and over and over and over again. So maybe even this week, is, you took it just a shot, just, just a stab at reading about Jesus in these first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Maybe you just read with, okay, like Jesus, here are the crossroads that I'm at right now. Just let me see your way. I trust your heart. You came for me. You created me. Just, just show me your way. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I just want to pray just for a minute, and maybe even in the quietness of this moment, Jesus would even just breathe a little life into us. Maybe Jesus would just say, hey, look, I I know the crossroads you're at. I, I'm right here. And maybe you just hear him inviting your, his way. And it might be radical. It might be 
the dramatic change or exit of a relationship. It might be the dramatic step into something that becomes available for healing. It may be in the dramatic step to just start holding things loosely. It, who knows? But Jesus, honestly, at the end of the day, what we need and what we desire, honestly, what we desire, is for you just, it's just to lead and make your way clear. Jesus, you are the king. You are the king. And all of us, all of us, have tried to live in the kingdom of the world, even in the things of it that are packaged as good. And we've found it wanting, to be honest. We keep bumping into some of the same voids in our life and same longings that it just doesn't seem to satisfy. So Jesus, we, uh, we're asking you, just show us your way. Show us your way forward through conflict. Show us your way forward through change and transition, through grief, through healing. Show us your way. We trust you. We need you. And we love you. We love that you would come and you would give yourself for us. And then not just leave us to somehow cling and hold on until we get to heaven, but that you would show us a way to walk in the fullness of life with you and all of its goodness. We love you for it. We trust you in your way. We pray these things, Jesus, just sitting, settled in the middle of your presence. Amen.